All right, perfect. So I had the opportunity to speak to both Dan and Kevin's groups in the last uh, couple of months. That was a real pleasure. And uh, some of you saw how I was using this uh, tool called OBS Studio to create a, a virtual environment. And so at uh, Ken and Dan's encouragement, I uh, decided to put together a few slides just to educate folks on, on how this works. The idea is really better presentations. We're all in the business, regardless of what our position is, of selling, maybe selling different things, but these kinds of tools I think can help us redefine selling. And I'm gonna suggest not just during the pandemic, but after. I do have uh, everybody's video up there right behind my webcam. So uh, if you've got questions as we go, I'm happy to you know, take them interactively. This is super informal today. Uh, just a little bit of uh, education slash knowledge transfer. Uh, I myself did not even know about this thing called OBS back in, <laughs> certainly not in March. Discovered it somewhere in April and May and it just seemed like a better way to do presentations. So let's dive in. You see my uh, virtual screen here and my virtual environment and I'm going to talk all about how I do this. So Open Broadcast Software Studio or OBS Studio, that's the technology. And this is free open source software built by the geeks of the world for the rest of us and uh, works on PC and Mac pretty much with equipment you probably already own. The cool thing about open source software is it's free. The downside is there's not a phone number to uh, call when you need support. What I will say is there are really great technical forums, the OBS forums, and so pretty much any question you have somebody has probably already answered it. And again, when you have these technical forums, a lot of the actual software developers are there. So if you have a new question, there are people willing to jump in and help. It is a little bit more work when you're dealing with open source software. You're probably familiar with a lot of other tools. If you run a blog, you probably run it on WordPress. That's another example of open source software. So let's dive in. Everything I do is about raising the technology quotient of Vistage members, and so this falls into that same exact category. Now, the concept of what we're doing is called visiting video compositing. And so pretty much, I think, looking at everybody here, you're using some kind of webcam, whether it's an external device or whether it's integrated with your notebook computer or maybe even your iPad or iPhone, and then you're taking that video feed straight over into Zoom. And so that's sort of the standard mode. What we're gonna do now is add a few layers of detail. And so we're still using a webcam, but in this case, I'm going to remove whatever real background is behind me so I can create just my silhouette as, or just my image as the uh, top layer. And so you see in my virtual environment here, I'm, I'm in front of everything because I've placed that as uh, layer one. Layer three at the back is gonna be whatever virtual background you choose. I picked this sort of post-industrial, I used to work in a building that had a conference room like this with a glass uh, garage door sort of fun to, to put it up. And so that's gonna be at the very back and in between I'm going to insert the presentation which is going to come right off of the same computer in my case that's running the uh, the webcam, and that could be PowerPoint, it could be Keynote, or literally anything else that you run on your computer could be extracted as a video layer from the overall display or from any window running on your computer. And all I'm doing is taking these three things in that order, so top layer, middle layer, bottom layer, and <laughs> punching them all together using this thing called OBS, and then outputting from OBS a virtual camera into Zoom. And so that's sort of the beginning and end of what I'm doing here conceptually. There's plenty of processing power on most of our computers in order to handle multiple video feeds at the same time or multiple images at the same time and do the crunching to put them into one output stream. So conceptually, that's where we're at. And so this is the actual interface for the Open Broadcast Studio. And I'll, I'll zoom this or blow this up a little bit for you so you can see it. And what you'll see is I've identified certain sources. And so my source number one is the video capture and that's coming from, I'm actually using a uh, MacBook Pro and it's just coming from the integrated webcam in this thing. So that's layer one that's getting me on the fly. We've got the uh, conference room 
over there. That's the virtual background. So my source number three and source number two is just the display that's actually running the PowerPoint or keynote presentation that you're seeing. And then all those get pushed together and output. Now, let me go into the user interface just a little bit more so you can get the concept. I'll tell you, when I first looked at OBS, even though I deal with a lot of different software, it didn't quite click. And then once I talked to one other person, he explained to me sort of what's going on and how it works. Once you get the concept, this is actually amazingly easy given the power of the technology. And so now we're looking at the lower part of the user interface. And uh, let's dive in here a little bit more. So I was just talking about sources there, right? Those are the video streams or display streams or images that are being captured for input. And then I'm able to output those in various scenes. And I'm gonna show you this in a second, but let's dive in to three scenes that I use all the time. If I want just the room that I'm in, and I would disappear, and I'll demonstrate this for you in a second, and the presentation would disappear, of those three sources, notice the, the little eyeball that indicates that they are either used or not used, on or off. When I want just the room only, then I'm only going to output the conference room, the static image. If I want me and the room, now you notice I've turned on two out of the three sources. So the video capture of me minus the green screen from the webcam and behind me, the conference room. And then if I want all three, and this is my standard mode, it's the mode you're looking at right now, I've simply turned on all three sources. There's no reason you're limited to three. I'm just showing, well, I think what for most of us will be a typical uh, use case, but this thing can put together as many layers as you want. I've never come anywhere close to taxing the capability of my MacBook Pro. And so all we're dealing with is, again, from the user interface, sources, that's the video or image capture, and then scenes, that's how we combine them. So let me show you what this actually looks like as it's broadcast to you. And then I'll show you how I do this switching. And so I have a little switcher here in front of me. And if I want just the room, I can say, hey, show the scene that is just the room. If I wanna add me into the room, now you see I'm in the room, not in the room, right? Just switch these scenes on and off. And if I want the slides there, there's the screen for the slides or not. And often if I'm in a dialogue mode with somebody, I'll drop the slides so they're not distracted. And then when I'm ready to start presenting again, I'll put the slides back up. Now there are several ways to do that scene selection. Let me show you three two of which are free, one of which is about 150 bucks, probably worth paying for, and that's what I'm using. And so OBS itself has the concept of hotkeys, so you can identify certain keys on your computer and pressing those keys will switch the scenes. And so for example, if I want the scene called Dave and the Room, I can define whatever keystrokes I want or combination of keys and just pressing that on the keyboard would do the scene switch. You see, I've got another one down here, uh, Dave and the slides, and I, again, could pick a different, there's all sorts of configurability here, but frankly, you're not gonna have to mess with most of those fields or most of the user interface to do what most of us are gonna wanna do. Pretty much, I think I've just explained the, uh, the features that are gonna be most common. Now there's a second way to do scene switching. I don't really like the idea of having to walk up to my computer and press the keys. So I wanna be able to do that a little bit remotely. And so there's a fabulous app that runs on your iPad, your iPhone, or your Android devices. And it's called the Touch Portal. And the basic version is free. And what they're going to allow you to do is define 16 different buttons that switch to different OBS scenes. And so that's pretty cool for free. The actual versions here you see have a lot more than 16 buttons. That's their game. They want to upsell you as you start to use more and more functionality. And so if you go above the 16 buttons, then you can pay. Most of us probably would never need to go there. And so Touch Portal runs right on your, your mobile device and talks wirelessly to your computer, whatever's running OBS Studio. Now, I have found when you're doing presentations, 
you know, Murphy's Law, pretty much anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And uh, having a wireless device talking to the computer to control it, it's just one more possible point of failure. So I actually don't recommend using Touch Portal. So either you use your keyboard within the OBS hotkeys and there's no point of failure, or, and this is what I have gone with, something called the Stream Deck. And notice Stream Deck has a wire right there which hooks in USB into the same device that runs OBS Studio. And there's various models with different buttons. Most of us can get away with one that'll go for about 150 bucks. And I use this, I love this for two reasons. Number one is the wire because you're never going to have any kind of Wi-Fi that gets in the way. As I'm coming to you, by the way, I'm also running uh, Ethernet right out of my MacBook Pro, again, trying to minimize points of failure during a, a Zoom session. The second thing I like about this is it's tactile. And so I can just reach down to feel the buttons without breaking contact with the webcam and simply control it without having to, say, look down to where it is actually located. And so to me, that's a great solution uh, for a couple different reasons. In any case, you'll probably decide that you want one or two or three different scenes. There's a fourth one I often use where I put the presentation onto, I don't know if I've got this program right here. Yeah, I put the presentation onto the whole uh, screen for you and just completely get out of the way. And so those are the um, modes of operation that I use and Stream Deck makes that switching really simple. Now, a couple of other pieces of equipment, and this is pretty nominal. I'm thinking maybe in the interest of better sales and marketing presentations, you find a conference room somewhere in the office and you deploy a little bit of equipment. I have a retractable green screen, as you can see in this image, just pulls right down from the ceiling. And uh, that is actually literally a photograph of it. You can see how nice and evenly it's lit. And all OBS is doing whenever it sees the green is it just that color becomes transparent as it were. I'm retained while the green screen disappears. The only trick here is you would never want to be wearing the same color that uh, is the screen or suddenly you'll be a disembodied floating head. It doesn't have to be green. OBS can remove any color. So you simply pick a color. Now I have no clothing this color, so this is really convenient, but whatever color you're not gonna wear that is not you, OBS can simply drop out and make transparent. I have a friend, a speaker out of Denver, and he decided instead of using a physical screen, he's just gonna paint a wall. He didn't want some garish green wall in his house, so he picked a beautiful blue, and then he just removes that blue from the background with OBS. And so either you get a nice retractable screen that takes no room or just paint a wall, whatever color you're not going to wear. Now, the one other thing that I do when I'm doing this so that I can see both my presentation and see all of you, and I also have the chat panel open, is I have really two systems here. I have the system that's running my PowerPoint or keynote presentation. And then I have a second system so I can also simultaneously look at and interact with the entire group that's participating. Now, just a couple of points. Uh, this is actually a table on top of a table on top of a Starbucks box to which I've uh, taped a piece of paper just so you're not seeing the uh, label there. The idea here is I want to get the webcam up to my eye height. And so you see the little green light there at the top that is eye height so that when I'm standing here, and by the way, I think better presentation, stand, move around a little bit, right? It feels like you're with an audience in front of a normal screen, but you want that webcam generally to be about eye height. And I'm making sure I'm well lit at the same time from left and right. And then we've got the presentation, which runs right here. Remember that was one of the layers going into OBS. And then I've got a view of all of you up here. So anybody raises their hand, I can interact directly. And so that's, that's the basic setup that I'm looking at as I'm talking to you. Notice also I have a nice quality audio mic. I'll tell you that people are far more attuned to good quality audio than good quality video. And when Zoom gets in trouble because there's either overload on their servers or there's a bandwidth problem, you know, anywhere in the internet, what they generally do 
is they'll keep the audio going clearly and cleanly, even as maybe they reduce the frame rate or even freeze. We're okay with a little bit of uh, glitchiness on the video, but if the audio is bad, we got a problem. And so I'm going with a pretty good quality uh, snowball blue mic here, probably $100 plugged straight into the USB port. And that thing over there is a uh, Bluetooth speaker so I can hear you very clearly. Now, a couple of closing thoughts, and then we'll just open it up to Q&A. But since this is about sales and better presentations, there are three words I'm always keeping in mind as I'm designing and delivering my presentations. And that is show whenever I can through a video, a photograph, some kind of illustration or diagram or animation or build show, don't tell. And there's a reason that we do this. It's because our brains are visual. And so your audience will remember roughly 70% of what they see and roughly 10% of what they read or hear. And so you notice I'm not doing a lot of slides with bullets and words and, you know, there's a lot of problems with that. Retention is one, but another one is if you're using a whole bunch of words, people are reading while you're talking and we can't pay attention to two things at the same time. So that's my overriding principle as I build presentations. Now, with respect to sales, if we have been in the past 100% in person with our sales operations, we sell B2B, for example, and then during the pandemic, we had to go to shelter in place 0%, there's something worth thinking about. We're gonna start coming back on that spectrum towards the in-person again, but are we gonna come all the way back? Should we come all the way back to where we were or maybe is there an ideal optimum place that is for many of us most the way back, but not 100% of the way back? You know, I mean, if you just think about it, probably neither extreme is ideal. And so let's find that optimal in the middle. Because in that not quite return to 100%, huge productivity gain. If I had to go there to talk to you today, I would have charged for this. I'm doing this totally gratis in service of your two chairs in part because all I had to do was put a little work into putting together the presentation, fire up my computer, jump on with you for an hour, and it was extremely efficient from a speaker perspective. And so productivity, cost savings, right? No travel costs. But here's maybe the bigger point to think about. Is it possible that in this new way, we could improve our sales process and make it even more effective than it was before? And so here I have a complete white sheet of paper. I'm going to redesign a sales process to be better. I didn't think of this myself. I've been talking to a lot of Vistage members and a lot of CEOs are talking about how they're evolving their sales operations. And so this is sort of the collective wisdom of the Vistage community. If in the past your salesperson and your prospect met face to face, well, that's what we were doing, I guess, because we always did it that way. But think about this. We have now been forced into the Zoom mode. And once you're in Zoom mode, what you realize is, I saved all that uh, travel time and travel cost and could be sort of right there in the moment, maybe do more sales calls in the past. But you know what? If there's not that travel overhead, maybe we're not gonna just do sales with the salesperson to prospect one-to-one. -one. Let's drive along our product specialist or tech support person so that we can actually have a richer conversation. And, you know, since the customer also doesn't have to worry about the travel time, maybe they're going to bring along their CFO. And so we're going to bring along our CFO. And so we're going to work the numbers on this deal as we go. And there's always gatekeepers, you know, those people that can say no. They don't say yes, but they can't say, or they say, they can say no, they can't say yes. They're not the deciders. And in my world, that's a lot of the IT people you know, they have to buy in on this. And so why not get them involved in this thing right up front and have them instead of as no's, at least not deal blockers. And so to me, because we have this technology of Zoom where we can come instantly together, that looks like a better sales call. Now, and again, this was not my idea, but this is other Vistage members doing this. Uh, CEO out of North Carolina told me about this. He said, you know, once we get these things together with more of our people, more of those people, their people, then we uh, fire up DoorDash and we get the same food delivered to everybody on their side 
and our side. And so now everybody gets their tacos or whatever. And here's what he said about this. So they've already had the sales call. And now we're having lunch. We're just chatting. This is what impressed me. Specifically one word about what he said. We are having the most intimate conversations we have ever had with our customers and prospects. Wow, so maybe there's a better way. And so my challenge to everybody on this call is start thinking about the sales process and how marketing supports that process. And is there an opportunity to come outside, out of the other side of the pandemic better than we went in? I think for a lot of us, that answer is yes. And so there's a little bit of a setup. Uh, as Kevin said in the intro, we're gonna spend about 30 minutes. I'm looking at my clock, only 25. And so, oh, you know what that was? That's just an image of a screen in a PowerPoint that I just did the move effect, take it out, right? Nothing magic, that was right in the PowerPoint presentation. Screen, move out. So with that, let's open it up for uh, Q&A. And a uh, quick shortcut on Zoom for you. If you're muted and you wanna talk, you can hold down the space bar. As long as Zoom is your active application, you're not over there doing Outlook or something. Space bar makes Zoom work like a walkie talkie. You should be able to just talk while you're holding down the space bar, let it go and try it right now, see if it works. You'll see the system fight. Yeah, Dan just did it. So uh, uh, just use it like that if you like. So questions or comments. I know that was quick, quick overview. There's not a whole lot to master here. And there's also not a whole lot to buy. <laughs> Got to like that for a uh, solution that maybe moves us to a better place. So questions are coming. Dave, I got a question. Jump in, Dave. Sure. Um, your lighting, because <clears throat> I'm sitting here looking at myself and I know I got a light over my, I'm going to shut it off because it looks terrible. What are you doing? What kind of, do you have like some stand up lights that you're using to get yourself lit well? I do. And so uh, when I bought the, uh, the green screen, it came okay. with a whole kit. So the company that I got it from, and I just bought it on Amazon for about $200, it's the word newer, but spelled with two E's, N-E-E-W-E-R. I, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but newer with two E's up front. And they give you this, the whole kit comes about yay wide, and then you know one foot by one foot, so it's carryable, portable. Okay. Um, it had the hanger for the green screen, and the screen itself, and it just threads right over a, a pipe or tube, which runs nine feet wide. And then it had four different uh, lights. And so on my left and right, what I'm looking at is um, a pair of, I'm gonna call them uh, 24 inch squares with a piece of diffuser fabric on the front. So there's just a single light bulb in each, but right. they've got this diffuser. And so it's, it's like I got a two by two light here and a two by two light here. So you get that, you know, no shadows issue. And then, then the other trick, and so this also came with the newer kit for 200 bucks. There's a pair of umbrella lights. And so they're literally umbrellas that go up and the light shines up into them and reflects back on the green screen. The trick with the screen, if you remember the photograph I took a minute ago, uh, you wanna get the color pretty even, right? And so the lighting there with those umbrella lights plus the diffuser lights covers me and gets a super nice even green there so that the OBS software has no problem dropping that out. If the green is uneven, you might get a little bit of, uh, uh, well, let's just say not clean definition between the person and whatever that background is. Not too complicated. Thank that you. was, I think that, that $200, that's pretty much all I spent. I already had the nice high quality microphone from my podcasting days, same MacBook Pro, same Bluetooth speaker I had before, uh, all on my furniture. My furniture is pretty hilarious because it's you know all stacked up to get that, you know, that webcam right to eye, eye height. Nothing fancy. All right, Dave, I hope that answers the question. Jump in, Craig. I see uh, you uh, end up and then I'll hit Dan next. So you've got, so running on your system right now, you have got You've got Zoom running, PowerPoint, and OBS running all at the same time? Yeah. Okay, so how do you tell, do you, uh, in Zoom, you had to change your camera to OBS? Yeah, exactly. Of your, okay, instead of your camera on your system. So you yeah. do that through Zoom, okay. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what it says. Now, I'm going to drop myself out of this as I shut down the presentation here. But I want to look at it. So now I'm looking at the Zoom controller. 
And if I click where it says video, it says OBS virtual camera. That's it. So it, I could run the FaceTime high definition uh, camera. That's native. That's how most people would do it. I'm running the OBS virtual camera. It just appears as another choice in that okay. same exact list. And similarly, your microphones will show up there. So Those I won't OBS. put slides okay. back up. But uh, yeah, it's just a different virtual camera coming off the same exact device. OK. And uh, just FYI, I've tested it with um, Microsoft Teams, uh, with WebEx, and with GoToMeeting. Uh, seems to be pretty darn good. So it's just a virtual feed instead of a, well, physical feed. Okay. Uh, Dan, and then I'll come to Eamon. So Dan, you had your hand up next, and then I'll get Dave, Eamon. Dave, when you showed that image of your computer and the, um, the screen above it and the microphone, I didn't see the touch portal. Where is where do you have that? Um, so I, I actually have it. Uh, I'm using Stream Deck, but Touch Portal will be the same Stream, place. Stream Deck. So relative to my webcam, it's about two two and a half feet down and a foot over, so that I can with this hand, while I'm talking directly to the camera, you know, do my switching right there. So it's just very convenient to put it there at the left hand. Uh, FYI, I'm using my um, iPhone is a remote control to advance slides. So I'm not even doing that. You can use your phone to run PowerPoint or so on, which gives you a lot of mobility moving around in your virtual world. Is that, uh, does that answer the question, Dan? Yeah, I, then I was, I was going to follow up with what are you using your phone for? You just answered it. Yeah, remote okay. control, right? So remote mostly control. you don't see it. I, I keep it down here. Mostly I'm standing a little bit closer. I also think, uh, frankly, when you are standing up and moving around, uh, you're bringing more energy to a presentation than if you're sitting down. And so I think to the extent you are the presenter talking to an audience, you know, get on your feet. And it sort of tricks my brain, but I feel like I am with you because I'm with my slides. It feels a lot like if we were doing an actual Vistage meeting to my brain. Eamon, you had a question. Yeah, just two things, Dave. Um, one was you mentioned two systems. Is that second monitor? Is it a second monitor hanging off your MacBook Pro, or is there some other configuration of those two things? You could do it either way now. When I started this four months ago, um, and I'm using Apple Keynote, that's their version of PowerPoint. When you ran Keynote, it would take over every device you had. If you had three screens, Keynote would be on all three of them. There was no way to. Uh, get that separate Zoom view. But about a month ago, if you update Keynote, Apple pushed a new release, which allows you to, to play Keynote within a window. You can make that window your virtual screen and then use a connected second monitor now. So I set it up before Keynote had that feature just so I could make Zoom whatever I wanted to be on the remote screen and then whatever I need here. But now you can do it all on one. Same with PowerPoint. Uh, if you run into any difficulties, I'd say just you know grab a second device. It could be an iPad or or what have you. And then I noticed uh, I noticed on your scenes you have sixteen nine and four three. Is that just the what? Is that just when do you sort of use either one though? Yeah, yeah. So I built some of my presentations, my newer presentations. I've been building the sixteen nine aspect ratio uh, because these days you know the old projectors, your VGA projectors, pretty much were four by three. Uh, these days, a lot of times when you're presenting, you're on a, uh, you know, an HDMI monitor or something, those are 16.9, right? They're almost twice as wide as they are high, looks a lot more movie-like. Mm -hmm. And so some of my old presentations, I never bothered to update. They're still in 4.3 mode, but all the newer ones I've built recently, they're in 16.9. And so it doesn't even matter. I can just press the buttons and run a 16.9 presentation or a 4.3. The virtual room looks the same in both cases. I look the same in both cases, but I'm able to lay out my slides properly to use. And I'm trying to use about three quarters of the space here, right? So I want, I want to be here with you on the screen, but I also want most of the screen to be the, the slides. And so the reason for those two is just different aspect ratios that I've been using to build my newer presentations. Good. Uh, Good attention to detail there, Eamon. That wasn't a question I was expecting. What else uh, are you guys interested in uh, with respect to this like amazing free technology? Uh, jump in, Kate. 
One of the things that we've been utilizing um, streaming presentations for specifically is going over prototypes with our customers. Ah. So have you utilized OBS to put a live stream at in, instead of a PowerPoint? Because that's one of the things we're doing is we're presenting, but we're showing the prototype to our, our yeah, yeah, and and so I have not. Many of my fellow Vista speakers have been doing that, so they'll have a second or even third camera, and so you can use that second camera. Remember, OBS is just allowing you to take whatever video feeds you wanted to find, A, B, C, D, E, and put them into however you want to lay them out on that screen. And so a lot of speakers use uh, two different webcams for uh, different camera angles. And then they'll even use a third camera that is aimed down at a document so they can do markup. Uh, so yeah, you can have uh, exactly, just get your second camera, that becomes yet one more feed into OBS. And then you can enable it or disable it through the scenes control, you know, turn it on, turn it off. Yeah, so that'll work great. I think you'll, you'll really like that. I also wanna point out, we're recording this Zoom meeting so people can watch it later but you can also record straight from OBS. And so this is an interesting way to make a you know, product demonstration or a more professional presentation that uh, you know, might be for training purposes or you know, use on your website. You get a really nice quality audio and video straight out of the OBS software. And I do that occasionally uh, as well, not just for live presentations. Other questions, other comments? Anyone uh, who's not on video, you want to uh, unmute yourself, jump in if there are any uh, audio only people that have questions, comments? I think Dan had a question. All right, well, jump in, Dan. Yeah, so, I, um, you know, Dave, one of the things that COVID has done is forced us to be more techy. And I'm not a tech person, I'm, but I'm learning quickly. But one of the things I think Kevin and I are faced with as chairs is we're going to have to have hybrid meetings where some of our group is in the room together and some will be virtual. So how do you, I don't know if this is a whole nother conversation, but is there a way to briefly, briefly describe how would you apply what you're doing to a hybrid meeting where some people are in the room and some are not? Yeah, it's going to work uh, largely the same, but I'll do a quick, uh, commercial for something Aim and I are working on. We are planning to do a, uh, back me up here, Aim, and I don't wanna sell something we're not doing, but we're, we're planning to do a webinar probably a week from today on exactly that topic. How do you run a good meeting, especially when it's in a hybrid mode? So what if your speaker's the only one remote? What if it's a mixed, you know, some of the group is in the room and some is not? You know, I think we figured out if everyone's on Zoom, we got that one, but it's when you have these different combinations. Right. And so uh, we're working on that. Um, Eamon, I am good for your proposed time tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, if everything comes off, we'll have that on the air in a week, but shortly, Dan, because uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we have the best practices out there for, for the whole Vistage community. That's great, thank you. Thanks for doing that. Any other questions or comments today? Uh, uh, by the way, Dan, what you said is so true. Uh, we, we got forced into this situation where all of a sudden we had to turn to technology to solve some problems as we got pushed into our distance mode. And so in the US, if not all around the world, we've gone way down the technology adoption curve. I mean, who would think we would have been doing this, uh, you know, at uh, January 1? It would never occur to you. And, um, and so I think that's a good thing. I think that these, these new technologies are going to help us on the other side be more productive in our businesses, lower cost in our businesses. And my personal opinion is that while um, leisure travel will probably return to what it was, uh, you know, once we all feel safe, I don't think business travel is going all the way back. We just learned that there's so much productivity and you know, sometimes being remote and using these tools that I, I don't think business travel, which by the way is the most profitable part of the travel for the airlines, you know, hotels, rental cars, I don't see that going all the way back anytime soon, like a, a decade. This is, there are some real permanent gains here. I would also point out one other thing for you to think about as you're considering your office layout in the future. You know, right now, even internal, we need to implement our social distancing. But later, you know, once we're on the other side of this with whatever magic bullet we have, vaccine, say, uh, that uh, big conference room, 
you still need that. You know, maybe three out of four weeks, you do the team meeting via Zoom and then one out of four weeks, why pay for a conference room for the whole month when you could go to your local co-working space, WeWork. And so I, I see us also probably uh, lower real estate utilization on the other side of this, in part because we've embraced the technology. Yeah, just think about what are the opportunities. The goal is not to get back to where we were, but to get to a better place. All right, other questions, comments? I think we're good. I think we're good too. Hey, Kevin and Dan, thanks for uh, pulling this together. And uh, we'll figure out how to get this out broad, the recording out more broadly to, uh, to people and just to handle any uh, other questions that come in uh, asynchronously.